Okay, so uh, I think it's time to start to speak. Uh, my name is Lei Zhang. I come from uh, Alibaba. Um, my co-speaker did not make here because of visa problems, so I will give you a solo speak today. And the topic that I would like to share is uh, embracing upstream Kubernetes in web scale organization, which is basically uh, some user cases and lessons we learned from um, maintaining Kubernetes cluster in more than um, like 10,000 nodes cluster in Alibaba. Uh, so this is a, a simple outline of today's topic, and I will give you uh, some little bit of talk about our background and how we uh, achieved the hard multi-tenancy architecture and how we fix the container headache and, of course, what is container headache. And we'll talk about the workload management and why we um, prefer the predictability. And, of course, we will talk about scalability in this 10,000 nodes cluster. And uh, the last but most important, we will talk a little bit about how we dance with with the upstream. Okay, so a little bit background is that uh, our team in Alibaba actually um, serves both Alibaba Cloud and Alibaba Group. The difference is um, Alibaba Group is the e-commerce system in China, which is actually one of the largest e-commerce platform in the world. But Alibaba Cloud is uh, actually the biggest cloud provider in Asia, and um, we also provide the managed Kubernetes service like AWS or Microsoft either. While in Alibaba Group, um, this is a little bit different because we basically maintain several internal Kubernetes clusters, and each cluster will have more than 5,000 nodes, and uh, most of them, uh, and the most one of them have like 10,000 nodes, at least, and we use them to serve this world's largest e-commerce platform, and that is actually the use case I will talk about in today's talk, and all of these. Um, Technology, technology stack under Alibaba Group is actually based on open source technologies, including Kubernetes, Operator, ContainerD, and Run C, and Cut Containers. So this is a high-level architecture. And as I mentioned, that we are using a very large cluster to serve all the business unit, business unit from Alibaba Group. And that also means this architecture should be a hard multi-tenancy model. Um, but before talking about hard multi-tenancy, uh, I need to mention that uh, what components we use in Alibaba Group. So uh, most of these components are open source and upstream components. For example, the Kubi API server, it's, it's totally 100% um, um, upstream component. But we do not use the default scheduler because uh, we have a lot of customized scheduling policies and algorithms we need to uh, implement. And also we um, focus a lot on the scalability issue. So we write our own version of uh, the scheduler. Um, we also use Kubi, Kubi Controller Manager, and we use several of the controllers, but we also implement several of our own controllers because we have our own road policies, and I will talk about this more in the later um, slides. And the, the whole cluster is actually bare metal cluster, but this bare metal cluster, all the physical machines are managed by Alibaba Cloud by metal instances. It's something like uh, on-premise instances from AWS or either. And because we have the, actually it's a, it's a fixed size uh, cluster resource pool, so we also have the connector, which is implemented by virtual kubelet. So whenever um, there is some uh, traffic burst or traffic peak, and then we can actually be, uh, we can, we can actually be able to schedule the pod to a, uh, another resource pool, which is managed by Alibaba Cloud by virtual machines. And this is actually implemented by uh, virtual kubelet. If you uh, happen to go to my talk during the virtual kubelet, you will know about that. So this is basically the high-level architecture. And I will go to more de details. And uh, the first of all I, I want to mention is the hard multi-tenancy model, which is uh, very uh, unique in our, um, in our cluster, because we are using a virtual cluster-based hard multi-tenancy model. And uh, the key idea of this model is that we hope or, or we prefer every tenant have a tenant cluster. So it's something like a Kubi on Kubi architecture. But the difference is every tenant cluster is actually composed by a, by a dedicated Kubernetes control plan, which is totally upstream components, but with several virtual nodes. So there's no real nodes for the tenant cluster. And the virtual nodes are basically API objects we implemented in the HCD. And these objects are virtualized from the real nodes by using a small engine, which name is virtual node engine, VN engine. And it is basically a proxy on top of Kubelet. So it will handle the inbound and outbound request between Kubelet and the tenant master. So it's, it's basically 
basically like a proxy. And we also have virtual kubelet in this place in case we want to schedule pod to other resource pool. But the idea is the same. We will, we will provide a uh, virtual cluster to, the, uh, to every tenant. And by doing this, we actually um, achieved to co-locating the workloads from every tenant in the same cluster and we share resources. And that's why we do not need to run Kubi scheduler in tenant cluster because we have a unified scheduler. The unified scheduler will handle every tenant's workloads because it is tenant aware and do the five, do the five grand scheduling based on the conditions of the whole cluster to achieve high resource utilization. And uh, all of these architecture and components will be open sourced during the KubiCon North America of this year. And if you are interested in it, you can just check the um, upstream doc we proposed in the upstream community. So this is the multi-tenancy. A second thing I want to mention is actually how we migrate applications from Alibaba to container. This is very interesting because Alibaba has been using container for a very long time, but I will say they are using container with an uh, anti-container pattern. Uh, one of the examples is so-called a rich container. So I was very curious what is rich container when, when I first joined the, the company because I'm thinking, okay, why this container is rich? Then I deep dive into the project, I found it very interesting because you can basically find everything inside this container. For example, you can find there's the application, but you can also find there are a lot of start and stop scripts inside. And you, you will then find something like SSHD daemon. You will find the log engine daemon. You will find monitoring daemon. You will find there is a cache, in, cache system inside. You will find there is a virtual IP client, DNS client. You will find there are a lot of proxies, service, service mesh engines. Everything is basically in the same container. And you will also find that the first process of this container is not the application. It's a system D. So, oh, I just got it. So the rich container means you can find everything in the container, just like the pocket of Dollar Amon. So that's why it is rich. Because it's not because it has a lot of money. And I also realized that the reason the people want to do that is just because they want to make this container act as a VM. So they can migrate applications more easier to this container. But this actually uh, caused a lot of trouble because the developers then become used to use this special container. They are using container like the virtual machine, for example. They want to start the container first and then log into the container and then start up application. They don't think that a container has the same life cycle as their application. That's the first problem. And the second problem is that they just want to write files freely inside the container. They, don't, they, they have no concept of volume. So they just write files, write dat user data in the container at the risk of losing the container someday. So this is really a um, terrible situation that we want to fix. And the way we fix that is using, of course, using the concept of the pod. I think you guys might know that the pod is basically a group of containers which has very um, tightly coupled relationship. So in Alibaba, uh, a typical pod in our cluster is like this. It will have an application container, of course and then has a group of other sidecars. Uh, one of the sidecars is the live upgrading sidecar, which is used for, li used for live upgrading data or application, which is supported by many Java applications. So the live, the live upgrade container, live upgrade sidecar will copy data from its image to the volume, which is shared by the application container. So application container can then load the data from this shared volume and trigger a reload. So we don't need to redeploy the application. The other sidecars are including the uh, service, mesh, service mesh sidecar, including some assistant sidecar like cache, DNS client, also including some monitoring um, or logging agent, that, which is classified as the operating sidecars. So the co co idea here is because you know, um, in, in the pod, the container actually share volume, so we can exchange files through the shared volume, and they also share the same namespace, so all the sidecars container can communicate with each other freely. But another thing I want to mention that as long as you are using pod, you need to pay attention to five grand container lifecycle management in this application. I'll, I just uh, list a very typical application or pod in our cluster. So besides the image or the uh, parameters of this application, uh, we prefer that you the developers to define the post-start hook and the pre-start hook for your pod. For example, you need to write your start scripts inside of these hooks or you need to write your uh, cleanup scripts in the uh, pre-stop hook. And besides that, 
we also uh, require developers to define clearly what is your liveness probe. That is, what is your condition to make sure that your application is healthy? So this is actually how we fix the container headache by using pod from Kubernetes to replace the rich container stuff. Another thing um, we, we want to mention is that as long as you have a lot, of, you have so many kinds of static cars, you have a huge number of static cars. So how can you manage these static cars? So we actually implemented a static car operator. The static car operator is actually, first of all, it has a CRD to collect all the information of, of the, all the static cars in your cluster. And the second, it provides you with operator. So you can define policies of static cars. For example, you can define policies of what kind of a static car you want to inject into what kind of applications. Or whenever a static car is Whenever a static car image is upgraded, you want to make sure you can roll out all the static cars in your cluster. So all of these operations will be handled by this unified operator to handle your, all of your static cars containers in your large scale cluster. So this is static car operator. And then how about manage your workloads in your super scale cluster? Uh, before talking about workloads management, we need to uh, make it clear that in Kubernetes, there are two concepts. First of all, the application. Application in Kubernetes is actually a bunch of YAMLs. There's no such thing in Kubernetes which name is application. There are no that kind of things. So it's just a, kind of, it's just a, a group of YAML files which can be generated by Helm or by Customize. But the lesson we learned from here is that managing these kind of YAML files in a super scale cluster is really a nightmare. I will explain how we do that later. And the second concept is workloads. The workloads are actually a group of controllers for you to define how to roll your applications or how to manage your applications. So all the concepts like daemon set, job, cron job, uh, stateful set, they are actually all workloads. So that's why we say workloads are actually predefined models of how you do rollout, how you do instance recovery, how you do batch deploy, how you do canary or uh, blue, blue green deployment. But the lesson we learned here is Okay, so Kubernetes has a lot of building workloads. They are, they, in most cases, they are well defined and work very well, and they, they are very easy to use. But in some other cases, they may not work as you expected. So okay, talking about the application management, we are talking about the YAML management. The YAML files management is really difficult in your super scale cluster, but there are actually some tools you can use to solve this problem. And the most important part I want to mention in this talk is we actually use GitOps with Customize to manage all the YAML files in our cluster. So we basically do not write YAML files or edit YAML files directly. We use Customize to do that. And then we build a huge um, Git, GitOps-based pipeline to generate YAML files from, your, from our CRCD system and then deploy them to the Kubernetes cluster. So this is application management. And the second thing is, as I mentioned, the workloads may not meet your requirement in some cases. That's why we created the open source project which named the Cruise, and this will be announced uh, next month. And the Cruise is actually what we call the Kubernetes Workloads Advanced. It's actually a fleet of customized CRD and controllers which will operate applications at a web scale. It is totally uh, fully pluggable because it's basically a group of plugins, and um, it will be 100% uh, open source in next month. And one of the examples I want to mention in the Cruise project is the uh, in-place state, which is actually our own version of stateful state. The reason we have in-place state is because in a large-scale cluster, especially when you are running an online business platform, then the predictability is really critical in your system. We don't want to see that whenever we do road, we just kill all the pods and create them. In most cases, we hope that we can upgrade the um, applications in place, we don't, we, so we don't need to reschedule the pod or recreate the pod. That's why we really prefer predictability. And on the other hand, actually, we can use stateful state to do that in most cases. But the problem of stateful state is stateful state only provides you with very limited role to policies. So that's why we implemented the um, in-place state. Uh, I just gave you a very sm very simple table to compare between the deployment stateful state and the implicit. I, I don't want to talk it a little uh, to talk to talk it a lot today, but 
We can focus on three parts here. So first of all, in in-place state, we implement a policy which name is in-place. That, so that means you can roll to our applications without recreating a part on another node. Everything will happen on the same node. Everything will be recovered on the same node. And then another strategy is retry on other nodes. So today, if you are using some building controllers, for example, if the node is broken, so application just cannot stop for some reason, just cannot start for some reason, then this controller will just retry again and again on the same node. It will not, it, it will never retry on, on another node. So we just add a new policy to infl to in-place state. So when if there are timeout for starting our application, this controller will automatically recreate the part on a new node instead of retrying on the same node. Another thing is that we added the pre and post update hook in the rollout strategy of in-place state, so you can just add your own logic in during the rollout, rollout policies for your applications. For example, you can say, I want to do something after 50% of the applications has been rolled. You can add a script like that, so this is a hook. So by implementing this kind of customized controller, we actually make it possible for so many business units on, running on top of our cluster can, in, can, use, can run their applications as they will. So that's, why we ha that's how we handle the various requirements from our app layer users. Okay, so let's talk about scalability. But before talking about scalability, I want to mention that you need to know that what is your requirement because when, they, when you want to deploy a, deploy a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster more than 5,000 nodes, you need to think about what is your goal. So that's why I list all the requirements here. In current Kubernetes upstream, the nodes limit, I mean the cluster scale limit is like 5,000 nodes. But in our cluster, we require at least 10K nodes in one cluster. That is our goal. So we require a lot of nodes. That's the first thing. Another thing is we require like 300,000 pods in this, in this cluster. If you make a calculation, you will find that we actually have no such too much requirement for the pod number because every pod in our cluster, their size is big. So we generally run 20 or 30 pods on our node, on every node. So we don't need to handle some cases which have a lot of pods in our cluster. So you need to make sure you understand the requirement before you do a scalability improvement. That's why we said the non-goal for our cluster is to care about the total number of the containers or pods per node, which is a little bit different maybe from your case or from your company. Okay, so this is our requirement. Please remember that. We care about large cluster, but not large number of pods. And another thing I did not mention here is that we have a huge number of, of CRDs and operators running in our cluster because we need to serve a lot of business units on top of our cluster. And the, basically every business unit will have like 100 CRDs defined to integrate with our, plus, uh, in, in, with, our uh, class, with our Kubernetes cluster because they may have their own platform as service, they may have their own Istio, they may have their own serverless platform. So every Every, every platform will use CRD and a controller to integrate with our Kubernetes. So basically, we have a huge number of CRDs and CRs running in our cluster, which also give us a lot of burden for the scalability part. I will explain this a little bit later. But before you figure out, okay, so after you figure out your requirement and you want to do some research on your cluster, the first priority is how you can discover the scalability issue in this 10K, in this 10K nodes cluster. So that's why we actually de developed a group, a performance benchmark toolkit. And this, there's no, some magic here because we are basically using the open source project which named the Kubing Mark. And uh, it, it is totally open source and uh, on the upstream. And we just made a little bit modification to, to integrate it, it with our cloud infrastructure. And we also implement a HTTP, HTTP interface on top of Kubi, on, auto, on, on top of the Kubi Mark because we want to make it more easier for us to trigger the uh, scalability performance test. And uh, the most important concept of Kubing Mark is that it will help you to create hollow nodes, which is basically a, a group of pods. And in order to do this performance test, we are actually using our production cluster online to do that. We, 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 do, not, we do not create a, a new uh, test cluster because we want to make, make sure every, everything is consistent with the production environment. So before we do the performance test, we will tend and drain nodes for, for this um, for, for this performance test environment. 
and they will run the application, run the uh, performance rep test application by just uh, sending um, HTTP request like this. We just send a HTTP request to our Kubi mark, and it will run, app, run the test. And the typical test cases in, in our web scale cluster is like we care about the startup time during scaling part. And also, we care about the time of creating and deleting parts in this cluster. And we care about the part listing return time. And we care about the fair accounts, of course. So whenever you have this kind of performance test system, then you can just try to run your test cases again and again to discover the, to discover the scalability issues. And according to our test, and of course, based on our requirements, we found that there are several issues in the current upstream Kubernetes cluster. First of all is, of course, SAD. We actually invested a lot in both, in both SAD and its, data bank, and its bank end storage, which is BotDB. And most of the issues happens in SAD is actually related to concurrency, locking, and data store. That is a BotDB. And the second thing we found in this critical path, which is between SAD and API server, is that the API server is actually very sensitive to the data scale, especially when there is a large amount of data, the API server will actually suffer from high pressure. It will just reject your request. And this happens a lot when you have a huge number of CRDs or controllers keep watching, keep watching or releasing your API server, or you just keep listing, for example, every node or every pod in your super, super scale cluster. Another performance issue we also, we also observe in our cluster is come from the customized controllers, which, you, as I mentioned, almost every business unit or every customer will actually install, the, install their own version customized controller in our, um, in our Kubernetes cluster by implementing their own operator or something like that. So this kind of pressure also um, drag a lot to the performance of our API server with the HCD, uh path. This is actually the critical, critical path of the whole cluster. But um, as I mentioned before, that we have our own version of scheduler here, so there's no such performance issue in our scheduler here. But if you are using Kubi scheduler on the upstream, I think you may want to pay attention to the QPS of the pod scheduling uh, of that project. Maybe I think it's a little bit, maybe it will be a little bit problem for you. I, I don't know the exact number right now. So as long as we know there is performance issue, so the problem is how to fix that. And we can take a look at step by step. So first of all, SAD part. As I mentioned, the SAD part is mostly related to concurrency, locking, and data storage problem. So we actually did a lot of work on the upstream to solve the concurrent, for example, concurrent, concurrent read, and to remove a lot of unnecessary locking in the code base. And you can actually check all of these PR and issues on upstream. We actually cooperated with the community to do that, but we actually have no any in-house solution. Every contribution has been uh, contributed, every patch has been contributed back to the upstream like that. Like that. And also, we noticed the BotDB, which is used as the, as the HCD backend, has a lot of performance issue because this project is actually not very actively, actively maintained. It's actually um, partially uh, maintained by, by Chorus right now. And for example, I just list uh, here, uh, we fixed the bug in the uh, SAD um, of DB part uh, by replacing the state structure from, um, from a list to the Hashi map, which improves the performance uh, like uh, 24 times comparing to the uh, baseline. And after we have cherry pick all of these fixes on the upstream, we also did a performance test again, and we found the result is very good. So the test result is like this. We have 100 clients to connect with this SDD. We have three nodes, physical nodes, to run the SD cluster. And then we tested with, it, it with 1 million red and key value pairs, and we achieved uh, the QPIs of 5,000. And the completion time of this test is around 200 seconds. And the latency, most of the latency is less than 100 milliseconds. So this is a very reasonable result if you have already cherry picked all of the patches from the upstream. The latest uh, release of HCD actually contain, I think, most of the patches, but there are still some of them not included. So if you are interested in that part, you, I, I think I recommend you checking all of these issues and PRs. So this is HCD part. And the second part is Kube API Server. We also cooperate with the uh, community to do that, and there are several outstanding fixes I want to share with you guys today. The first of all is 
port listing indexing. And this actually, uh, this patch cannot be contributed to upstream, but we will do that very soon. Um, by adding index, by adding index for listing part, you can actually achieve a lot of performance improvement um, in this uh, critical path of your API server between your, con your controllers or operators. And also there is a very interesting um, um, uh, issue on the upstream, which name is um, the watch bookmark. It, it actually what we are doing with Google uh, recently to implement this feature. The bookmark will enable you to add a bookmark to your watch API. So whenever you want to restart all your controllers, your controller don't, don't need to restore all the watch connections just as, we, just as it is doing today. It just restarts the connections from a, from a certain bookmark because it knows that there's nothing changed um, before that bookmark. So this is a very important improvement if you want to, um, it's especially you have a lot of CRD the controllers running inside your cluster. And also we recommend you to cherry pick uh, several of the upstream patches here. And one, one of the most important is the uh, incremental heartbeat, which is actually uh, something like, uh, for now the nodes, so now the nodes don't need to report the heartbeat to, to, heartbeat to API server periodically. It just uh, updated the heartbeat to API server at on demand. For example, whenever the nodes is updated or there's too long certain time, there is no update. Now, this is actually uh, one of the um, pull requests which has been merged on upstream and uh, we highly recommend you to cherry pick this patch because according to our performance test, the result is very good. So after we have cherry picked all, all of these patches into our cluster, we also did performance test again. And our test is like this. We have 10K nodes, we have 100,000 existing pods, and we test the, 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 the operation of scale 2,000 pods in this cluster. And the QPS is more than um, 130 pods per second, and most of the operations actually completed in within three seconds. Another problem we actually um, observed during this performance test is, which is still ongoing, is that the metric data from API server can actually crash Prometheus when you have a super large scale cluster. And this part, we are still figuring out, figure out the root cause, and I think uh, maybe two weeks later, we will, we will send, send some patches or issues to the upstream to talk about this part. Okay, so this is the Kubi API server part. The HCD and the Kubi API server is for now the critical parts we observed in our cluster, so that, that's why we actually send a lot of patches both to the upstream and also to our own version of the code. But before talking about modifying the code, we want to mo mention that two concepts that we are, we, we, of course we modify the, co the code of Kubernetes, but we, we don't think we are forking Kubernetes because there are some differences. So when we're talking about fork, normally we are saying that we, are, we will lock down to some certain version of the Kubernetes, or we modify the API of Kubernetes, or we just uh, build something on top of Kubernetes to hide the API server from the, our customers or we just bypass some of the Kubernetes core logic. For, exa for example, we bypass the controller pattern of Kubernetes, or we just bypass some interface of Kubernetes. Or we just uh, replace the Kubernetes of, we just like replace Kubernetes to some other engine to your cluster. So we think if you do that, you're actually forking Kubernetes. But what we are doing, or we think the best pra practice is more like, first of all, in our cluster, we will keep upgrading our cluster version by, by keeping by keep a true release lag from the upstream. We have already done this, we have already done this rebase for one time and it works very well. So currently our cluster is 1.12 and the next, I think next month we will upgrade our cluster to 1.14. So this is how we keep tracking with the version of the upstream. Second, we will never change the API of Kubernetes. And, and, and essentially we have no patch on API server side and we send all, every scalability patch to the upstream. And also, we, I, we think it is um, very important to over-respect Kubernetes philosophy. That is the declarative API and the controller pattern. And we also leverage Kubernetes standard extension ability points, like CNI, CSI, to implement every feature we want to have in our cluster. We will respect every interface here. And of course, I think the most important thing is we will never replace Kubernetes with something else. We will respect Kubernetes as well as the CI. So that's how we keep our cluster, keep upgrading healthily and rapidly with the 
with, with, the, with, with the Kubernetes upstream. With that, we also build a very interesting model in our company, which name is uh, which is A Kubernetes. The A Kubernetes is uh, actually a tiger team within the whole Alibaba company, uh, which which is responsible to cooperate with the Kubernetes upstream. In order to do that, we actually build an internal upstream, which name is um, A Kubernetes inside Alibaba, and this is more like a mirror of the Kubernetes upstream inside of the company, but it will carry the, some patches or critical fix on, 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 the, on the code path. And the upstream team will cooperate with upstream, with Kubernetes upstream, based on the uh, e-Kubernetes code base here. And on the other hand, uh, we also maintain a downstream code which have two, two, two version lag with the e-Kubernetes code here. So we basically, have, we basically maintain two code base in our company, and the, the, the downstream actually are using the internal upstream instead of the Kubernetes upstream. The reason we do that is because, as we mentioned, we need to serve both Alibaba Cloud and Alibaba Group. While Alibaba Group is, uh, well, Alibaba Group is more like an in-house cluster, but Alibaba Cloud is what we, have to, we need to face in the end user. So we need to make sure that everything used by Alibaba Cloud is fully upstream. So that, that is why we use another upstream code base for our cloud provider. And uh, by using this model, so all of, the, well, all of the, our partners and our affiliate companies will actually consume the Alibaba Kubernetes infrastructure, which is a downstream of the A Kubernetes code base. So this is how we cooperate with upstream. And for now, uh, this model works very well. That is also how we contribute patches to the upstream. We do not just, uh, we just, we do not just pull code from the uh, downstream code base. We, we actually, first of all, we, we contribute to the internal upstream, and we uh, send pull requests from the internal upstream to the real Kubernetes upstream. Okay? So this is a summary of today's topic. So first of all, uh, we use Kubernetes both, for, um, both as any user, which is Alibaba Group, and also as a public cloud provider. And also we are using a virtual cluster-based multi-tenancy model to serve all the customers, cu customers inside Alibaba Group. And we use the container design pattern to migrate the applications from Alibaba, from the old Alibaba infrastructure to the new Kubernetes-based infrastructure. And also we implemented our own version of a customized workloads management system to handle various requirements from the top layer uh, users, which may be different from stateful state and deployment. And another reason is that we really prefer predictability in this case. And because this, this web scale Kubernetes cluster is huge, so we think that a performance testing system will always be your first priority if you want to build this kind of cluster in your organization. And we actually modify some part of the code of Kubernetes, but we will follow the philosophy that we will never fork. And this is also how we serve both internal and public, code, public cloud provider, because we have two code bases and we cooperate with each other. And the last thing is that I think you guys might also try to build a small uh, upstream team. It's really fun and rewarding. So this is the end of my today's share, and thank you very much. If you have any questions, please uh, just ask. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, we use RPVS in our cluster, but um, it's only for part of the uh, user cases. And in other user cases, we, we mostly use DNS part. Yeah, please. Uh, so this is actually a step-by-step -step program. And the, we started this program at the middle of 2018. So for now, it's like uh, one year. We just migrated 30 percentage of whole Alibaba infrastructure to Kubernetes. And the goal is by uh, 2020, uh, 90 percentage of Alibaba will move to Kubernetes. Uh, it's already been tested. In 2018, uh, there are 13% of traffic is handled by Kubernetes. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, you can talk with me offline. <laughs>